I probably think it's really cool how it takes the elements of what made Sublime so amazing, but then kind of brings it to a different audience of today. And that's just because I've been told that, you know, from people, you know, who are like familiar with Sublime's hits, but don't know like the cuts, you know what I mean? So they just know like the gist of what a Sublime is, you know? And they're just like, you know, they know like the hits and then they obviously know like the songs that I've done. And, and, you know, I've, I've, I've heard them say that, you know, it's like, it, it's cool how you could take that band and, but modernize them today. And, and I, I loosely use that word modernizing because it's such a whack word, but, you know, in an essence, you know, there are young kids in our shows now, you know, who like sing the lyrics to some of these songs that, that are new, that, you know, and then I watch them, we go into Scarlet Pagonias or STP and they don't even know the lyrics to that. And that fucking blows my mind because it's like, how? Right. But I think that's that. I don't know, man. That's that's part of that shit where when I was telling Jim, Brad's dad, like, I'm honored to do that. I'm honored that you get to hear my shit and then you get to listen to what they did in the past and be like, oh, fuck. That's the real shit right there. Like, you know, that's like I like that. I'm, I'm honored to play that part, you know. My name is Rome Ramirez, and I sing and play guitar for Sublime with Rome, and this is the oral history of the band. I was born and raised in Northern California. You know, anybody from California will tell you that they're almost like two different states, Northern and Southern. You know, it's way different vibe, different weather, everything, you know? And uh, so I, I wasn't really familiar with Sublime's music until um, I was down in San Diego the summer. Uh, I don't remember what year. It had to have been like maybe nine. 96, 97, and I was really into like rap. And, and my uncle was like, yo, check out my CD rack over there. There's a CD that says in green writing, it says Sublime. He was like, check that out. I think you're really gonna like it. And you know, I was like, I've been listening to the same thing all summer. So I was like, I'm down, you know, get some new shit. And I popped the CD in and like immediately, like Garden Grove came on and I was like, this is tight. You know, I never really heard anything like it. I was really familiar with like, Bob Marley and Peter Tosh and stuff because that's what my dad really listened to. So I was familiar with reggae and like hip hop, but when I heard Sublime, it was like, it's kind of like putting all of it together. You know, it was like a little bit of hip hop, a little bit reggae and then the punk rock is in there. And on that first album uh, that I heard, which was a soft titled one, it, it really encapsulated, I think, you know, perfectly what their influences were. And, and I fell in love, man. It, 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 it like captivated me. You know, I was like, I want to know everything about it. I loved it so much that that summer when I came home, I was like, I want to get a guitar. We we had a guitar in the garage because my dad played drums in a punk band. So it was like really easy for me to just kind of go in there and dick around. And and I was just like really into it, man, from, from the jump. It, it turned me into just like a music listener to, to like, I want to play music. The first song from Sublime that really like I thought was like the best song in the world was Wrong Way. I don't even know if I've like really heard ska prior to then. When I heard that song, bro, it was on repeat, like constantly. And I still do this to this day. When I like a song, I wear it the fuck out. Um, and I just, man, like that was the song that 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 really stuck out to me. And then um, I remember I wasn't too into what I got because I remember hearing it on the radio a lot. So, you know, you know, when you're a kid, you're not really into hits, you know, you're just kind of, I, I like all the B-sides. Garden Grove, Wrong Way, um, I love Seed, that was a great record, and Santeria, man, I, that, I mean, how could you not, that song, one of the world's greatest songs, you know? Simple, that's what I really liked about Sublime, it was really just simple, but still just potent. I got into like playing guitar, and, and for me, it always started with just like wanting to learn their songs, you know, learning the covers, because I just wanted to sing them, you know, like, even to myself. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's weird, but like when you do that, when you start just wanting to learn other people's stuff because it sounds fun, like even to this day, I still do the same thing. I'll hear a song and be like, damn, I wanna learn how to play that. that I just wanna sing it. Um, it, it. It teaches you stuff. You listening to it and, and you're like, oh, you know, I, I wanna write a little something, you know? And for me, you know, I, I used a lot of like what I was going through at the time, which was just pretty much, you know, some 
fucking girl in high school or something that was like probably breaking my heart or some shit. So I was just like writing about that. Grew up listening to Sublime. So I was like, of course, you know, I'm going to throw in some influence there. You know, I really love like Nirvana. So like, I, I like the arrangements there. And then Primus is weird. So I want to make sure like, you know, these weird tones. So it's like, I can't really speak for every musician, but for me, like my, my originality has always been um, just drawn from in, like my biggest inspirations. So yeah, when people are, you know, like, you sound like Bradley. I'm like, that makes total sense because I learned like from him, you know, I don't know him. So as far as like personality goes, you know, I can't really speak on that, but we definitely grew up in two different times. So I feel like a lot of that, you know, they were really a part of the, like the crack epidemic as it was like coming to fruition. And then, you know, just as like politics were, I mean, it's really weird right now, but back then it was like without the internet, you know, you were, like people who you really leaned on for truth, you know, were fucking lying and stuff like that. So, you know, I feel like culturally we have a, a huge separation, you know, just as far as like what he's going to be writing about and what I'm going to be writing about. Brad was literally like the boss DJ. He listened to all kinds of music. One of his favorite bands was The Cure. I had no idea. Eric told me that. That blew my mind. But you listen to songs like Romeo and like, you know, Get Out and stuff like that. And you're like, oh, dude, I could totally hear, like, the Cure influence, you know what I mean? Or, like, oh, that's a Robert Smith, like, effect on the vocal, you know what I mean? Like, so, you know, like, it's cool to be able to, like, reverse engineer stuff like that. But, like, for me, I was a fan of him growing up. Like, he was my Robert Smith. We're different in that regard where he created that sound that we all fell in love with, and I am a product of that sound that he created. I first met Eric in a recording studio in Orange County. I've always loved recording music and I wanted to go move to LA so I could become like an engineer and then just start bumping shoulders with people in the music industry and hopefully get a record deal or something. And um, so I, I moved out to LA to, to become an engineer and to like go to the school to like help me, you know, get contacts and stuff. And after going there for about four weeks, I met like completely separate. I met an engineer in Orange County and a record producer who had a studio in, in Costa Mesa. And um, I would just go to that studio every single day and just hang out, like, you know, mop floors, go run and get cigarettes for people, like whatever they needed. And um, I come to find out that he's like really good friends with the bass player to Sublime, Eric. And I was just like blown away by that, you know, because obviously, like I was saying earlier, I'm like a huge fan of the band. Um, so just to meet him would be so fucking rad, right? And dude, like one day he just came in and like he just he pulled up in like a G wagon and he was smoking like a huge blunt, total rock star, you know what I mean? And I was I was outside smoking a cigarette and like I didn't like introduce myself yet. I was gonna wait, you know. I just said like, hey, you know. And like you know, Eric's kind of weird dude, so he was just like, you know, hey. um, and I was like, holy fucking shit, that's you know Wilson from Sublime. And then, and then I went in there and then Louie, uh, the engineer and producer, um, our mutual friend, he was like, yo, I want to introduce you to this kid I've been working with, you know, his name is Ron, blah, 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 and Eric was super cool. He's like, what's up, man? I just want to smoke, you know? I was like, oh, yeah. Um, and, and then from there, man, it was just like, just, I was just that dude at the studio, you know, who like could like sing and play guitar, you know, but um, and we, and we just became cool, you know? I just like started to go over to his house parties and just hang out and jam and, and it, yeah, it just, just happened like super organically, you know? I was just stoked to even just take pictures with his bass guitar, it's like, it's tight. He doesn't like playing Sublime songs. He only plays Sublime songs when he's on stage getting paid for I'm like, he likes playing other shit, you know? I get it. When we were jamming, I, I knew everything he'd throw at me, all the punk rock stuff. Cause I really got into punk rock in my uh, teenage years, like after listening to Sublime, I'm like, who are these fucking songs? Like, you know, people would be like, oh, that's not their, you know? My dad would be like, oh, that's that's a Clash song or something. I'm like, what? And then, you know, I'd go down the rabbit hole. And I instead of going down like the rabbit hole of like the no effects and, you know, lag wagon and stuff and no slight to them, um, I was just super interested in like the really trashy, like angry kind of shit. You know what I mean? This was right during my years when I was like, fuck my dad and everything. So it was like, it was perfect timing, you know? And, um, yeah man like i just i got into a lot of the shit that they liked and really into it you know i knew the song so we'd be playing and he would just like start going into something on drums and 
you know, he'd be like, hey, you know, uh, that Secret Hate song, you know, like Babel? I'd be like, yeah, let's play it, you know? And be like, whoa, you know? So, and, and we did that for years, like two years. That's just what it was, you know? We never played one Sublime song, except for at a party. And then at his parties, he'd be like, because people would bug him, you know? Dude, play a Sublime song. He'd be like, right, I'm going to go grab Rome, you know? <laughs> Honestly, with him, it's all about the music. He's not like really having fun unless he's on stage jamming or like unless we're jamming backstage or something, you know, like he doesn't like the press. He doesn't like, you know, like having to go and do like, you know, the radio interviews and all this stuff like that. It's like you're having to choose the artwork or, you know, just for him, it's always been about the music and that's how it speaks to him. So it's like, as long as like we're able to create and perform, like he's like happy, you know what I mean? Um, and as far as like, you know, telling someone to chill out, I'm usually telling him like, bro, come on, man, we got to get up in the morning. He's like raging with his homies, you know what I mean? But I don't know. It's like, we, we have that, that, that type of dynamic where, you know, it's like, it's kind of like the bulls, you know what I mean? Where we all kind of play off of each other's strengths and weaknesses, you know? Because where I lack, he picks up greatly and, and vice versa. You know what I mean? Like I have incredible focus, but he has incredible vision and artistry, you know, and, and, and I can work up to that, you know, hopefully, but he, it's just in his blood, man. You know, he truly operates just from his own playing field, not in, like, not, not really like influenced by anyone else, um, his decisions. And I just think that, you know, I, I learned from that all the time. He had a Halloween party. We, we had done the, the, to like play a couple sublime songs at his parties before maybe like three or four times and then he had this like halloween party and and we played like like four songs i guess he called bud and was just like dude i'm jamming with this kid we should get together and just jam from that point on like the word really started to kind of like go around long beach long beach is really small um it's big but it's like really small kind of community and and the word just really started traveling. You could go online and see, you know, stuff like you know, in the forum days, you know, people were like, oh, this Mexican kid's playing with Wilson, you know. And it's like, so there was like this shit going on, and and it was kind of on Eric's mind, and um, and our soon-to-be manager, he had just like kind of freshly reunited Rage Against the Machine for Coachella, and. He had caught wind because he's like mutual friends with Eric through through this studio guy as well. He had just he had just randomly caught wind, like, oh yeah, the dude from Sublime's been playing with this kid. And, you know, apparently he sounds like Brad and it sounds really good. And, you know, Cheese is like, man, I haven't talked to Eric in a while. Our my our manager, Cheese. Um, he he's like, I hadn't talked to Eric in a while, and he caught up with Eric, and Eric told him, and then they just started talking about it, and then you know, one thing led to another. Um, me and Eric are driving down in his G-Wagon to Reno to go and jam with Bud. He hasn't talked to Bud or seen Bud in like seven years. Uh, I'd never even met Bud. Just knocked another rock star off my list that I'd love to meet. You know, I was like, this is tight. You know, whatever happens, happens at this point. I don't care. You know, like, I don't got nothing to lose anyway. This is rad. Um, I'm jamming with Sublime. And, you know, we, we go up there and I mean, dude, it was like a fucking movie. I we knock on the door, Bud answers the door, and it's just like, "What's up, Bud? Um, you guys want some water?" And we go in, we get some water in the fridge, and then he's like, "The jam room is upstairs," and we walk right upstairs and started playing punk rock, like, like that. Didn't sit down on the fucking couch, didn't smoke a cigarette and chat. We just went straight upstairs. And they started playing songs that they knew since they were kids, you know, fucking Minor Threat, Bad Brains, Misfits, fucking Poison Idea, Seven Seconds. And it was just like, I don't know, training or something. But I was there like, come on, let's go. And then Bud was like, um, you guys want to start playing some Sublime stuff? And I was like, oh shit, here we go. And they would start playing some Sublime stuff, you know, and it would kind of fumble around like the second verse. And I'd kind of be like, you missed your part, you know, Eric, you're supposed to go here, but you're supposed to maybe like, fuck, you know? And it was like weird, you know, cause then I'd be jamming to the stuff off the way they did it live on Stand By Your Van or off something that I watched on a YouTube video from like Warp Tour. And then, you know, they'd be like, 
you know, kind of like, because I wasn't on the CD, you know what I mean? But so there was these weird synergies that were happening as, as we were playing. And, um, and then after like four hours of that, then we took a break and then we got to chill. <laughs> but it was like, it was a trip, man. It was scary. <laughs> We stayed at Bud's for like three days. It was like, okay, cool. Talk soon, I guess, you know? And we went home, maybe six weeks later, you know, Eric and Bud are like, let's, let's jam again, you know? So we went and we were jamming. We were at Bud's house again, or this time we were at his his mom's house. And we set up all the band stuff inside of his, his mom's house. And we're all jamming in there. And um, our like soon to be managers came and, and, and they were like, you know, they throw down the spreadsheets of like, okay, this is the tour. You guys can be going on and we can take these buses and Jay Leno and <laughs> all this shit. And, you know, I'm watching Eric and Bud and it's like, mm -hmm. cool, right? You know, I'm back there like, what? What? This is crazy, you know? And they're probably, you know, they're, they've been in the music industry. They're just like fucking, you know, we'll see when it happens. You know what I mean? Um, cause everything that they've done, they built on their own. So I, I respect that. You know what I mean? And I, I mean, I'm like 19 at this time, I think. Yeah. I'm 19 at this point. And you know, I'm just like fresh moving. I just wanted a record deal. Here I am just playing with like sublime literally in like his mom's house. And I'm just like, this is fucking nuts. And, um, and then, you know, that, that, that whole thing happened. And then we went home from that. And then, oh no, and then the next day after that, we played a secret show at a Mexican cantina right around the corner from from um, where we were staying. And I guess like the word got out or something that we were gonna be playing this cantina. Like we booked it on a Friday to play on a Sunday. And you know, it's a Mexican cantina. It holds like a hundred people, maybe 80 people max. There was like 600 people that sh showed up for the show. Like the entire downtown of like Sparks, Nevada was completely blown out. There were fucking just, it was, it was like madness. You know what I mean? People from Canada, people from Singapore, people from the United Kingdom, Hawaii, all there because Bud and Eric were on stage playing Sublime songs for the first time, this kid. And this is like before like Twitter and stuff like that. So, you know, it was like a really, you had to just know to be there. And, and we played that show and we kicked fucking ass and we knew we kicked ass and it sounded good. And, and it was just a really rad energy and a really rad feeling. And then that was it for like a year. It was like, you know, our managers were like, okay, we'll call you because the guys don't own their band name. So it was going down that route. And I, again, 19 years old, I was like, I'll see you later, I guess. I, I, got, I gotta go get a job while y'all figure this shit out. You know what I mean? And like, I have everyone in my corner like, dude, you're jamming with Sublime. Like, are you rich now? You know? And I'm like, I don't know. Should I be? You know, I call my manager and be like, yo, should I be rich now? Like, I just jam with Sublime. Like, can I get some money? I'm broke. And he's like, fucking go get a job. You haven't done anything yet. I'm like, oh, okay. You know? So it's like, it's just this weird time. But during that whole time, they were doing the lawsuit and, you know, all that stuff. But yeah, I always tell people, like, because a lot of people ask, like, what was it like going through that lawsuit? I'm like, dude, I was 19, fucking still playing at, like, the gas lamp for dinner and $100. Like, I don't know. <laughs> they didn't call me until they needed my ass on stage. But then after we did that, we played our first show at Smokeout in front of, uh, like, 25,000 people. And that was it, man. Like, it kind of showed everybody, I think, that the people wanted to hear the music, you know? They're stellar musicians, man. And I knew, and I know the band so well. And I, you know, yeah, I was nervous, but I know the band so well that deep down in my bones, I, I, I know I wasn't going to drop the mic. You know what I mean? I know I wasn't going to fumble the ball because I just, I know that band. It's, I know those songs better than I know my own songs. I swear to God, I do. I knew that we would sound great. I knew that we would pull it off. I just didn't know if, if the people would accept it. And they loved it, you know. Here we are, ten years later, still, still traveling the world playing music, you know. Eric wanted to keep, keep writing music. That's like, because new music is his thing, you know what I mean? Like even when we go into interviews and stuff, like he'd rather talk about the new album than talk about the old stuff, just because, you know, he's like a real artist in that sense where he just, he writes it and sets it free, you know, it's the thing of the past, you know. If you want to know what it means, read the lyrics backwards, you know, kind of guy, but. Um, you know, and then, and then, you know, but obviously the business side of music is, you know, you got a product out and you got to, 
you know, go and sell it and all that, right? But, you know, for for him, it was always, like I was saying earlier, it's always been about the music. That's always what's really, you know, influenced him live or uh, in, influenced him was just playing live music or recording new music. And so when when we got together, like we were writing new stuff. We wrote Panic before we played that Mexican show and at, at Bud's mom's house. Like, because we were just there. We'd already jammed. We're like, yo, you want to fuck around with some new shit? They were really dead set on keeping it sublime. You know, you, you got to understand that these guys had as much sweat equity as Bradley did in the band. So for politics, for them to dangle their band name to them, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit demeaning to them, you know, and, and you can obviously see both sides of the story. Absolutely. But, you know, having said that, them, you know, Eric, Eric did not want to put the with Rome at the end of the name. You know, he was very adamant about keeping his band, his band. Um, and Bud was at the time as well, regardless of what he says. And, um, but for them to be like, okay, you know what, let's, 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 let's accept, you know, sublime with sublime and we'll tack on the with Rome thing. That was like a really big thing, I think, for them. That, that was a really big risk for them because they're toying with the legacy. I stepped into it. I'm, I'm grateful for my position. But to them, these guys, they are sublime. This is everything to them. Every, it's everything to me, but it's everything to them. It's their flesh and bone. So these kind of decisions are really, really, really big decisions that, believe it or not, go way beyond a dollar. You know, it, 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 has, to, it has to make sense in the heart you know, and in the head. And I think that was a big risk, but here we are, you know, we're the driving force of promotion for that brand period. And everyone's happy, you know, this is great. New people get to listen to Sublime every day. People who never seen the band or heard the song it's live get to, you know, experience it with their children. And it's just, it grows, it's continually growing. So, you know, I think that that, that risk ultimately paid off for them. The politics of calling it whatever they wanted to call it, that's an afterthought. But the idea of us having that synergy and then writing new music, you know, that was a very exciting thing, you know, I think for everybody, because they also hadn't done music together in a long time. You're talking about years of just living with those songs, you know, living with the records. You know, they, they, would, they would band practice and whoever's house would let them band practice that day. You know what I mean? Oh, so-and-so's gone for a couple hours. You guys can play in there all day. And they'd show up there and then run through their set. You know what I mean? And their set consisted of these songs. They didn't have any money to go record all the time and stuff, you know? So it's different than, you know, like before a band ever gets a paycheck, there's this, we're all in this sinking ship together. You know what I mean? You eat, sleep, and breathe this fucking set. This set is your... It's your album that you may record one day if you get lucky. It's also your live set that's got to fucking blow people away. Really living and eating and breathing these songs. And by the time it comes to the studio where it's like, okay, Mike's hot, let's record it. It's fucking muscle memory. They've been playing it in basements and in stages for fucking 10 years. You know, Santa Ria was Lincoln Highway dub on Robin the Hood. You know, their, 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 their second album, you know? So like, and a lot of these songs were songs that they've just had for a very 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 long time in fact if if i have it correct um you know halfway through the self-titled album i think bradley was really struggling a lot with this addiction and you know there was a time where they were fighting to put more songs on the record so they were having to like you know revamp half demos and squeeze them together and make tracks to put on self-titled because you know there wasn't really a shit ton of music for the guys you know what i mean like um you've you've heard everything fans are always like dude you you know what's like i know there's more music let out the new music and it's like dude they would if they could you've heard every fucking thing you've heard shit that you know that i've been told that even like brad probably wouldn't have wanted to be heard you know what i mean so and we've all heard that stuff from our favorite bands it happens you know like the estate will do what it does but you know at, at at that point you know it's it's like yeah, they they lived, ate, and breathed those songs. Versus in today's time, you know, they weren't as big as a band as as we are now. So we're out traveling 180 days out of the year, touring, playing shows, doing press, blah blah blah. blah. And then it's like, oh, you guys have to get together and put out an album as well. So it's like, it's just a way different cycle, you know. And that's for every band after they get their, you know, once they get in a tour bus.
pretty much. We didn't really have a lot of time. Probably about half the album were songs that I'd already previously written. They were like, cool, we'll speed it up here, slow it down here, or put a punk bridge in here. It was like, cool. Um, and then I'd say probably like the other half of the album was just stuff that we would do, like together, like live in the room. But we didn't really have a lot of time because this was like right in the very beginning of the band when it was just like super hot. So it was like tons of shit going on. You know what I mean? Photo shoots and fucking iHeartRadio this and you know, all that shit, right? So it was just like really madness. And it was like, put together an album. You guys have three weeks, which is the reason why we use like, you know, half the songs that I had written previously. And if you go on the internet, you can find my versions out online. Um, and they're obviously much better with the guys on them, but, uh, but yeah, man, you know, it was, it was like, it was a, it was a trip because, you know, they, they really wanted to get into the studio and make new music. They were really adamant about when we come out in light with the band, we want to have new music as well, like right at the forefront. So, so we got cracking on that. Cyrus was cool because we just got too much time. <laughs> they're like, we're like, we want to put out another record. We'd done a lot of touring over the last, like, I think at this time it was like four years. And we wanted to just hit the studio. So so we did it. And, and we had like a good couple of months to just thaw out and just get weird, you know? And that was kind of like the process of Sirens. And Sirens was really like us all just making the music together, really just kind of like compiling each other's influences and stuff. So that's why, you know, it kind of takes like a roller coaster of songs, you know, it goes into like ween territory and then like, you know, it'll dive into like some reggae and then like, you know, some like dubbier kind of stuff. That first album to the second album, I, I still had a lot of growing to do. Like I was still just, just so fucking flashing lights in my eyes. You know what I mean? Um, from sirens to blessings that's where that growth happened we graduated i feel we got a lot closer we had time to make an album and i had kind of refocused everything that i was doing you know priorities and people i was hanging out with and stuff like that um i just felt like i was in much more of a focused place to 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 do what we want to do you know and eric was in a place where he just was really like focused on it as well, which is kind of crazy for Eric because he's always got so many projects going on in his head and stuff. For him to really be like, you know, I don't think I really like that artwork. It's like, whoa, okay, tight, you know, I'm glad. Um, so it's like, I don't know, there, there was just like this like immense growth and, and we felt it, you know, we, we felt it in the studio. We knew we had some good songs and, and we knew that we were just tighter as people. We got a new drummer during that as well from Josh Freeze to Carlos Verdugo with bringing new people on the team it all that the dynamic can it, it can either go up or down and and you always pray that it goes up and it works but in this instance it really did my life became sublime the moment that I decided to dedicate my life to this band because it was pretty much like this like my my manager and Eric they were both sitting on the couch when they called me over to ask me you know if, if I'd be down to do this idea um and and uh my, my manager was like, there's two roads you could do. He's like, because you're a talented kid. I believe in you. He's like, we can put you in a band. We can get you touring, get you a record deal. And, you know, you'll, you'll probably be doing what you want to do at the level you want to do in about seven to 10 years. Um, or you could join Sublime and you could ride that and, you know, have fun see what happens and i was like fuck my shit let's go jam with sublime man <laughs> that was it that's all i needed we played the show in hawaii and and i got to meet brad's dad and that was that was you know really really just big for me you know what i mean um you know we like he, he wasn't like come here oh it's so good to meet you you know what i mean like you know he's he's a businessman he's a man of few words as well um but just to be able to just tell him, you know, thank you for, for a lot of different things, but just thanks, you know what I mean? And, and it's an honor to be st sitting here, you know, singing your son's message to thousands of people every night. Um, that, that was really big for me. And, and, you know, to this day, you know, I'm, I'm still very grateful for, you know, for, for the family and, and everything that, you know, they, they've done, you know? I'm at Post at a shoe store in LA. We were, you know, at Flight Club, and we were just looking at kicks, and then his girlfriend was just like, 
like, hey, babe, that's the dude who sings for Sublime. And he's like, yo, are you the dude from Sublime? We saw you in Dallas. I'm like, yeah, you're fucking post. He's like, what's up? You know, we got to link up. So from there, we've always just like kept close. You know, we've been cool. And then, um, and then this idea for the Bud Light thing came up because he really wanted a band. We just happened to have like the same agency, not the same agent, but our agent happened to be sitting with his agent as they were talking. Like he was just on his phone as they were talking about, you know, like, oh, it'd be cool if you got a live band. He's like, dude, I'd love to get a live band. And, and, and our agent was just like, what about Sublime? You know, Rome. It's like, holy shit. So Post texted me, he's like, yo, would you be down? I was like, fucking absolutely, bro. Send us whatever the songs are. We had like a week to learn the entire set. We never got to practice it once because we were in the middle of our summer tour. And we got there and we showed up and we just were live. And it went smooth, thank God. No fuck ups, you know, no like drop the ball or nothing. It like, it went smooth. But we did jam prior to that. And dude, we jammed pretty much that whole Nirvana set. Cause Eric likes Nirvana as well. So that whole like Nirvana post set, like was super into Nirvana. But he knew, you know, we were jammed a bunch of Nirvana. He knows some Primus shit. We play a little bit of Primus. He's a good musician, man. He's a, he's a real one. I'm working on a song like for him, but I told him, I was like, dude, we need a feature on the next album with you. So we'll see if we can make it work. But he's a superstar. So it's not as easy as just sending it to him. And then his manager's like, here's your verse. Go ahead. Here's your biggest superstar in the world. Go ahead and put it on his shirt so you can sell as well. You know, it's fucking hard to get these guys, man. It'll sound anthemic, you know, something like Westwood, you know, bells and like reverb, but with like, just like a haunting reggae undertone. I hope I never have to look back on the band except for when I'm in the casket, you know, because this shit is, this is a lot of fun. And we have a huge family now, you know, we have, you know, we roll with our dogs and our wives and our kids and our friends and our barbecues. And, and it is, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a family. And, and I think whether or not bands performing or not, that feeling and that legacy will continue on. And, um, and when I'm dead and I'm, you know, in the ground thinking about all this shit, I, I just, just think of it as just a damn good time, man. That's, that's what it is. Just a damn good time, you know? It's a lot of fun. And I hope the party never ends.